Hello and welcome to the next episode of Cylinder Radio. I'm your host, Will Roosh, high school teacher in Los Angeles, trying to bring more viewpoint diversity to the just general conversation in society. So Cylinder Radio is about different perspectives. And from one side, you're seeing a circle. The other side, you're seeing a rectangle. But it's actually more complex than that. And my guest today embodies this kind of thinking so well. Um, I have been a fan of hers on social media. I use social media to try and connect with people and it's really working. And I'm thrilled to have her here and I'm gonna hopefully get her name right. Uh, Salome Sibonet. Beautifully said. All right. And, uh, <laughs> and um, there you go. I, there, and then um, she is a writer, producer and podcaster. I'm sorry, writer, philosopher and podcaster. And I threw philosopher in there because Reading through, um, I only know you through social media, and but reading through what you post, it is deep and cuts really to some really like core social science that I've studied, and I've had on a lot of you know college professors that are, you know, really deep into social science and trying to understand different things, and I'm close to Jonathan Haidt and all of his moral foundations theory, and you encapsulate these really complex ideas very simply. And that's something I, I admire a lot, the idea of taking something extremely complex, like the complexities of um, viewpoints and perspectives, and you cut it down to something that's just really easy, simple, digestible. And when you can do that and it holds up, because I, whenever I see a quote that's short, I'm always like, oh, where are the challenges here? Where the, I'm going to try and challenge this. I'm like, wow, that one holds up. You do that over and over and over again. So um, Salome, thank you so much for being here. I really am looking forward to this conversation. I am too. I am glad to be here. Um, I have been also following you for a while now. I know you invited me a while back and I kind of spaced on your invite because at the same time that you invited me, I was getting so much uh, feedback on my work at the exact same time. And it was just so overwhelming um, because I think, you know, I think it's great that you see my writing and my work as being able to encapsulate these ideas in a very succinct manner because mm -hmm. I personally think I'm extremely verbose and in horribly wordy and so I end up with these giant you know captions on things because when I think of these I do the same thing that you do which is you take kind of like a principle or a quote and you look for where the nuance is missing yeah. there. And it's very easy to find that with a lot of uh, the more nice city kind of like Instagram caption quotes or whatever. But um, I grew up in this environment, like this internet environment. So I, it's almost like it's inoculated me. It's, it's trained me to look for things in that really critical way because I, it's, it's almost, it's not a great thing probably because I end up sometimes becoming almost lawyer-like in the way I'm mm -hmm. writing things mm -hmm. because you know how people have to, you have, kind of have to put a clause after everything. Well, this doesn't apply to every situation, always for everything. But um, yeah. the way I kind of get at things in my own perspective is there is, I do have a background in psychology. My degree is in psychology. And um, so I grew up reading psychology textbooks. I've always loved that. And um but at the same time, I kind of approach things more from, you know, I, I like the studies, I like the research and all of that. And I try to keep, make sure that the things I'm saying are backed by some right. type of, uh, you know, truth, truthful or verifiable idea. But at the same time, I think that you don't need to have a list of statistics or citations with you at every time to know what is true and what is not. You know, I think people, I think people maybe underestimate their ability to discern what is true and what is not. And um, personally, in my own writing and my own work, it's it's always been a struggle for me to balance the kind of uh, okay. Let me talk about things from the more philosophical point of view, which is not going to use citations, and I'm not going to put a bunch of statistics, versus here are all the facts, Here are, here's all my sources. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, we're on the internet. You have 
every source you could possibly want. There is not, it's not a problem about not having information or not having the sources. It's kind of that we get into this really locked mindset where, and I've seen people do this a lot, particularly on social media because it becomes, it has a very collectivist culture to it where, which I really dislike. I admire what you do. And not only do I admire it, I think it's a little insane almost how you are able to kind of go after these tedious, contentious conversations again and again. I can barely respond to comments that are positive. And it's that, you know, there's the real, there's conversation that we have where we talk to each other as people. And that's a totally different type of conversation than what happens online for the most part. They're almost not even similar in any, any, any way that you could try to measure them besides the fact that they're an exchange of words, because there's an audience in that fact that there's a whole idea of being in the arena that factors into the way people communicate on social media. So I see this way that people, um, you know, you can have a conversation and you can want to get to the truth of something, or you can have a conversation because you want to represent something you want to, um, present yourself as being in a certain camp. Uh, You want to garner a type of uh, social stance for yourself. And it is a really tricky thing because social media trains us in a way to kind of seek that out. I mean, this idea Mm -hmm. of likes, followers, Mm -hmm. that's all uh, an appearance-based, appearance-based metrics. And so I think it, it, it perverts our ability to converse in a more productive way. Um, I see people do a a particular, I mean, these things come down to a kind of, um, you, you put it well, it's a kind of intellectual humility. Um, I think you've discussed this before where, you know, you can discuss things and try to win an argument, but that's not the same as trying to discuss things and find a truth or something, you know, or gain knowledge. When you can win an argument and walk away with nothing new, no truth, nothing but, you know, the little trophy you have of, well, I'm right or I won this argument. So if that's, that's, and that's again, that's kind of a, a status game where we're indicating, we're, we're seeking something else besides truth or knowledge or any, any common ground or anything like that. And um, you can see that happen a lot where people will take argument A and say, well, argument A sounds a lot like argument B. And if you're making argument B, that means you're person C. And so we do these kind of little like t- little techniques, little, little uh, strategies to d- dismiss the actual argument and instead condemn the person making it or the way that they're making it. And so in a way, when I try to put forth my own ideas, I have that in mind. I know that people do that. And so it makes me very careful in the way I articulate things. Yeah, I mean, that's, that makes sense. The way, when you, like, um, my wife was gifted this book called Homebody. Are you familiar with it? By um, no. Ruby Cower, I think is her name. Oh, she's a poet. Yes. I've heard of her, yeah. Okay, so I go through her book and it has very short like yeah. statements that are like true in there, similar to what, like the kind of stuff that appearances would look like your stuff is. But I read through it and I, it makes me go like, wait, what? Like, yeah, like yeah, one, yeah. one of them was um, uh, a man can't give me anything that I can't give myself. And See, I was reading this no. next to my pregnant wife. And I said, <laughs> what about a baby? <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, like, exactly. like this isn't like these, these a few things yeah these platitudes these are these are just overly simplistic yeah. and they might make you feel warm and fuzzy but it doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy like i just I, it's just so easily dismissed that i don't it doesn't resonate with me and maybe people like that but i don't get it. like i don't know what that is i think um, the question comes yeah, down what are your to- thoughts on on that kind of stuff like th- those like those like bits that look on the surface to a lot of people they might read your stuff and think it's similar yeah yeah yeah. 
Yes. Not- okay. I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I'm familiar with her work and I've seen some of these things. And personally, I, I mean, I hate to be, uh, you know, a negative whatever, but I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan <laughs> of simple statements that are, you know, uh, it's in a way it's a generalization. It, it, it's, it's lazy to make a short, simple statement that doesn't take into account the complexities of the world, you know, because again, what are you seeking? That's what it comes down to. There are people that are seeking something that re- just simply reinforces what they've already believed about themselves. And a lot of, um, sorry, Rupi, a lot of her work is uh, for a certain audience. It's for women. It's for women that are kind of developing this sense of, I need some self-esteem. I want to feel better about myself. Great. That's great. But that's, you know, I can tell you all day, you're great. I love you. You should be happy. You're perfect. That's not going to get to the root of something. And so that's why there's these little, you know, when you really are seeking out a kind of intellectual honesty. And I mean, I, my whole thing is seeking out truth. That's kind of, I I try to live in terms of values as opposed to ideas because ideas are ever-changing ideas can be disproven, you know, even facts, things like this, um, depends how you present them. It, it, these things are transient. You know, you have fact A, well, tomorrow you have fact B that actually changes fact A because now you have more context. So rather than cling to certain kinds of information, I align myself with the way I collect information rather. So rather than seeking, um, a certain idea, I seek something true. And so that can take me from here to there and back again, depending how the information changes. And I'm fine with that because I don't attach myself to any type of part, any particular idea or information. I don't gain an identity from um, this narrative or this fact or this idea or this uh, group. And it, it frees me to be able to leave whatever idea or group as information changes, whether that is accurate or, or mo- most productive or beneficial. And so when I see, um, there's a lot of things like this. I think in a way, social media has really um, degraded. I, you know, I am not totally, to let me, make my disclaimer. I'm not totally against social media. It's not that it's an evil, an an irredeemably bad thing. Of course, it's amazing. It's an amazing technology that's enabling us to have this conversation now. So I'm completely cognizant of how powerful it is of a medium for communication and the the sharing of ideas. In a way, um, because of social media, I think the the general... um, the general intelligence of the population that is most in tune with social media in a way, this is very careful to, to, to discuss, but is raising because we're able to take in so much more information now. It's amazing. You know, when I was younger, uh, me and my friends were, we're just idiots. You know, we were, we didn't know anything about anything. We had to get, we had to get stuff from books or from like these archaic websites, like a MySpace type of website. Now it's just like anywhere you look, you can gain really high quality information very easily. Uh, that's it's mind blowing to me. Yeah. So, I mean, on average, we're able to be much more intelligent on the general population than ever before. I mean, just literacy first of all we can all read i think people really take for granted how novel that is and how new it is that most of the world at this point can read that's amazing um we couldn't even communicate through social media if literacy wasn't predominant in our country so uh, going back though when you have um we have these kind of short ideas or whatever it's i just think that you know it's no longer enough to kind of um, align yourself with a certain ideology or a group or what have you. You really have to define your values by which you sort through all the information we get now. And because there's no shortage of those kind of short platitudes and ideas. I mean, it's, it's actually 
overwhelming how much the average person now has to sort through a barrage of differing ideas. Because even if they create their kind of filter bubble echo chamber, there's still a variety of different ideas within that echo chamber. You know, they can all be related and all be on the same side, but they're still presenting all these different ideas. I mean, it's insane when I look, sometimes I, I, I look through social media or whatever, and people are discussing like regime changes in Latin America during the, this century and how it affects the, the development of their children and the culture. And it's just like, what? This is amazing that we're at this level where we have that much information that someone's like 16 and that's what they're consuming. But, but now that's why it's not enough to have that information. It is really important to actually develop a system by which you grade and engage with that information. And that's, I mean, when I write anything, the, the main thing I ask myself again and again is, is this true? Because there are things I write that they sound real good, but they're not exactly true. They're a little lazy around the edge. So I have to take that and I, I can't sit with it. I can't sit with it because I know it's a weakness in the sentence or the statement. So I have to take it back and see, well, what is this weakness in that statement? What, what, you know, and it's like, again, that idea, like you were reading the poem and you said, well, that's, that's not exactly true, is it? You know, and, and so that's how you decide to engage with information though, is do I take this and I say, well, this affirms something enough that I like for me, so I'm going to take it in. Or do I engage with this information and say, is it true? Is it true? It's a very simple question, but we don't ask it because it's a lot of work to sort through everything and constantly ask yourself, is this true? I mean, this is critical thinking though. This is something that we're supposed to be, you know, we were supposed to have learned in our grade schools. Yeah, we're supposed to. I mean, that's one yeah. of the things I'm pushing for pretty hard. Um, yeah. Like, how did you get to this kind of, so a lot of your stuff um, is about being curious and, and mm. um, not lashing out and, and things like that. Like, just, just like taking a pause and, and being soft and, and trying to like, you know, like not contribute to the negatives and, and labeling this is bad and just leave it at that and all that kind of stuff. It's very similar. It's very aligned with the stuff that I do, which is why I think this is a good conversation, even though you and I are in our own kind of little echo chamber. Yeah. Um, but I had my own journey to get here because I was not always like this. I mm -hmm. had my right wrong. And then I, my world was turned upside down in several ways. And it got me to go, okay, I don't know what I got. I get, I just got humbled. I don't know what true is like sticking with what you're saying. I don't know what true is. So now I'm going to be super open-minded and just try and figure this out. Did you, did you have a, you, you, you're writing comes off like you went through a journey or something along those lines. Is that accurate? It's very accurate. Okay. So I think that um, it's, it's very interesting because I don't have a really large following yet. And I think in some ways it's because I play both sides of every argument so often. Yeah, so it's same. very yeah. hard. Yeah. It's very hard to build a kind of like, I mean, if I got on social media and every day I was just like railing on like some feminism thing, like I just had like my one shtick mm -hmm. narrative and I stuck to it and I made it simple and I made it consistent. I'd be like the Beyonce of whatever right now. Yeah. Cause that's simple. That's easy. It doesn't challenge people. It's predictable. It's all the things that people like now. I can't do that because it's boring. That's the other thing. Like, it's just boring to me. So I'd rather have my whatever uh, small following of people that are in, there are people out there that are actually curious, that want to think critically, that are very, you know, it, it's amazing to, to, to find, because, you know, when you're really, it's a lonely road to do this kind of thing of, uh, is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Because you can never, no, very few groups want that person in their group because yeah. is it true? True is a very threatening, uh, uh, it can be very good if you know how to use it. I mean, if you have a group and you want it to be good or you have an idea and you want it to be strong, you do want a person there asking you, is it true? Is it true? Because that's how you test something. But, um, yeah, but it's social media. I'm sorry, but it's social media. And as you said, like you're, you have your issue with social media, as do I. But uh, were you, I think you and I are both using it to try and do something good and contribute something better to this very poisonous landscape. But like when you say that, like the juice, it's a lot of squeeze to do what you do, to put yeah. something out there that's really brilliant and deep and complex. 
and then not, you know, you might only get, you know, whatever, like X amount of likes, like, you know, where if you just like owned someone on the right or the left, or you just yeah, you know, push yeah. something really like simple, it would blow up. So it's, it's, it's like, it's a lot of work for not a lot of social media payoff. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Continue. But that's the thing. I mean, it's a, uh, it's again, um, you know, I'm very wary of, I, I don't, I, I, I am, um, I'm suspicious of those kind of public figures to begin with, because yeah. if your narrative is that consistent and it never changes, something's not right there because the world itself is constantly changing and um, you're constantly getting in new information. So if it, it's, you know, even I have to, um, I'm very careful when, when I speak and I, I, I usually speak in very, um, this is why I don't comment on things that are like very prescient and very contemporary news events because, you know, I've had, I've had, I've had like tweet storms written where I'm like this thing and that's happening. And then I wait a week and then a week later it completely changes because new yeah. information came out and I'm like, Whoop, glad I didn't put that out there because it was wrong. You know? So I just, I find that even in these very, um, uh, temporal events, there are, universal ancient truths mm. that you can use to analyze and grapple with them. So I go to that rather than, you know, it kind of frustrates me even because if you step back enough, um, you can see all these different events um, that happen, whatever. It's like every day there's a new event, but it's of the same ilk, you yeah. know? And so you can, you just end up having the same discussion, the same topic, the same uh, debate again and again and again. And, but you, you switch out the characters or you switch out the color or the clothes or whatever you, the, the way you dress up the argument changes, but it's at the core, it's the same argument. And so I tend to step back so that I don't end up getting stuck in the, the minutia of whatever the temp the temp Temporal event is and still be able to kind of explain and grapple with what's going on in contemporary society. It's not like I'm running like a stoic philosophy page where I'm just like, here are the quotes of the ancient days. This is the problem is that like, you can read uh, like Seneca or Plato and say, yep, this is still true. And it'll be two lines. So it's that same idea that there are some truths that you can put into two lines and they remain true for thousands of years. How is that? Well, you know, that is exactly like, what is your intention? I don't think Plato was out here like, well, this is going to get me likes, you know, he <laughs> that wasn't his game. So it's again, it comes back to this intention. But to answer your question, because I got away from it. Um, the idea, you know, yeah, can you bring us I... through into that? Like, how, like cause I, I think that what you do is important, but there's a lot of people that haven't gone through that journey. It is a disruptive, yeah. really turbulent journey to, to end up, I think where you are, where you're at, where I'm at, um, people that, you know, you, we, you and I have like similar acquaintances, like Africa Brooke or someone like that. Like, yeah. she, you know, they go through these, these processes. So can you share what yours was as much as you'd, you'd be willing to share? Because I think that that's valuable for people who, who are confused by yeah. a lot of this? Well, you know, it's very easy. I was super woke. Mm -hmm. I was of that camp. So I, I've been there. I, that's why I know the psychology of how these things work so well, because I was in it. You know, I did all the things. I made fun of white people. I, I, I had that whole like power metrics thing. Oh, it's not racism as long as it's not institutionally backed. And then there were these little cracks along the way that started to get bigger until I couldn't ignore them anymore. So and when was when this? This, uh, I'm so bad with time. Um, I must have been, um, I think it was 22 or 23, um, bef bef right around the breaking point where I started to realize this doesn't, this doesn't. I don't know how old you are. So, uh, was this oh, like I'm, I'm 29. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe like six years ago. So that'd be like 2015 ish. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. Okay. That, that just yeah. helps. I'm trying to think of like where society was at that point. Yeah. So. This wasn't okay. a thing. By so then. you were in that kind of thinking. Okay. Oh yeah. I was doing the whole thing. I was, uh, you know, uh, making fun of people for cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. I did the whole thing. I was insufferable and I was doing it before it was, you know, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially I was doing it, you know, to my friends being like, that's not right. I was a super, I was a card carrying mm -hmm. communist. I was the whole deal. Oh. So 
I've been on that side. I know the whole psychology of it because I know um, I embodied it. And it's funny though, because now I'm on the other side of it where the friends that I once was like, you shouldn't do that because cultural appropriation. Now they're picking it up. And I'm like, hey, no, actually that's, it's not what you think. Yeah. So, but there was these little, there, there, that's the thing is that, um, when I was younger, I didn't, you know, I didn't have this kind of philosophy where I, I wanted to tell the truth to myself. I, I, I was, I was kind of more concerned with, um, you know, which is like normal for a person that's younger. I was concerned with who I seem to be, like who I appear mm. to be, uh, with identity. Yeah, we're building yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is a big yeah. deal because you, people gain a lot of identity from these kind of identity politics and these ideas and whatever. They get, they tell us who we are, which is great if you don't know who you are and you're not yet willing or ready or able mm-hmm. to tell yourself who you are and to figure that out. And so, you know, it's kind of like this ready-made identity. So I picked on to these things and um they, they, they serve the purpose of giving me, you know, my identity and giving me a sense of superiority too. Uh, because I was, you know, I've always been like the, the articulate and able to argue circles around people, which is nice, but that doesn't always mean that you're in search of something benevolent or some kind of truth. You can just be a great orator and very argumentative and good at debating without actually trying to pursue truth. And so, I remember that I um, had a boyfriend at the time and I was visiting his mom and with him and I was making fun of him. You know, these kind of jokes, like these woke jokes or whatever. Um, He was like, oh, you don't have to wash the dishes. And I was like, I know that that's what white people might do, but my Cuban mom would beat my ass if I did not do these dishes. His mom, who's like, was like 60 something years old, was in the other room and she heard me and she's like, honey, you don't have to wash the dishes. Don't worry. And it just struck me how mortifying it was for someone that's not in on the whole theory to hear me say something like that, because it only works if everyone else knows. If not, you're just a jerk. It just sounds like you're a racist to make fun of people for their race and to say stuff like that. It doesn't feel good. And it only feels good when you're in the right peer group. And when I was, when I didn't have that backing, because my boyfriend at the time knew like my whole shtick and he was not into it, but he was like, whatever, you know, he knew enough to be like, yeah, I get it. And, uh, but his mom didn't. So here I was sounding like an a jerk to someone's wonderful mother for like these kind of like like my little identity points or whatever to kind of you know play this game yeah and try so to explain was, like yeah try to explain like, explain like I'm, I'm a nice i'm no I'm, no 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 it's not bad because it's i'm a good person yeah, it's, i'm a good no, person no. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not racist because i'm thing. good you know, woke exactly. this is like a paint by numbers to morality. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Like, it's so it's really, it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, there is no shortcut to morality. You have to be what you say you are, yeah. you know. So this is, it, it was like, that was, I never forget that moment because mm-hmm. it was like one of the fatal cracks in the identity I had built out of this ideology. And, um, and that's ultimately what it comes to is like how how far are you going to to push it until it breaks eventually it'll break and you, have you to know lean it's into like- it you chose to lean into it huh like like mm-hmm. when people see that crack they go oh oh, oh shit no no i'm gonna get away from that crack because yeah. it's, it's like jordan pearson talks about it's burning off the dead wood of your of who you are that's right. and that's a terrifying concept but you yeah it's a loss of identity you leaned into it yes Why? so you know, the, it, it felt so uncomfortable. I guess, I don't know. I, I think I was partially um, really sensitive to that in a way. Because, I mean, you know, one of the things that is so um, pernicious, I think, about the kind of uh, um, idea that it's a moral superior position to, to take these ideologies and like, well, it's okay if I denigrate certain people as long as they're in this class group or whatever, is... Um, it does prey upon people that are looking to do good. This mm-hmm. idea that, you know, like anti-racism, all these things, like it really only works on people that are actually nice 
because oh. people that are actually racist and don't care don't care if right. you call them a racist or whatever they don't care so instead you have people that want to do something good they want to be good and they're you know eating themselves alive trying to to you know uh, exercise this like immorality from them using these tools that they're given um but it's ultimately it, it preys upon that i think like it really does suck people into this idea well this is how i'm good this is how i have to be good and then it's, it's like this little uh perfect storm where I'll, okay well if you're you know hostile to this group then it actually improves your standing with yeah. this group and this is you know it, it's you kind of have to um there has to be, this is, this is also goes back to what we we're saying. Like, this is why I don't really argue with people online mm -hmm. because it really is, um, unless someone is genuine and looking for it already in a way, most people are very closed to anything that's going to come close to, uh, having them question a part of their identity. And that's, what's so pernicious about these things now is they become identity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I use social media for, and you might see this if you follow my account, like uh, when someone says something, I'm terrible or whatever it is, I invite them to have a conversation, you know, face yeah. to face. And I mean, it's almost zero. I mean, I mean, a lot, <laughs> when you were like woke, w would you have engaged with some, I mean, I, I think it's partially because I, I am fairly well sorted out in my thinking. And I don't think that just the easy kind of talking points would, would work. I don't know really what, like maybe they think that I, I'm a threat in some way, but it's, I got, I've gotten every excuse in the book, but would you engage with people? You'd, you'd yell at them maybe in a comment section, but if that was around back then, but actually, which they'll happily do. But when I say, no, let's go live video so we can look each other in the eye. That's when it says, no, they just said, yeah. keep it in the comment section, keep it in the comment section. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that those interactions where you're just constantly like blocked or shut off anytime you're just like, okay, let's talk about it. Let's, let's actually let's talk about engage. it. I'm genuinely yeah. curious why you think so differently than me. And I want to I want to tap into the woke brain. Well, that's the thing is that it, it is it, it cannot be accessed. I think it's by design, because it, it's um, and this is and it's not particularly specific to that kind of ideology. I mean, you can have this with a certain kind of religious belief or any type of belief that is very central to someone's identity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're gonna be hostile yeah. to any uh, possibility that they'll have to let that go. And that's what that conversation is. And this is why I, at this point, I mean, I don't, I'm not really tied to anything. You know, I had recently, I did a podcast on free will. And I know this is an interesting one because it was a little bit like this gets into a little bit of a, people are kind of tied to one camp or the other. Mm -hmm. If you're against the idea of free will, you're very against it. And if you are for the idea of free will, you are very for it. Um, and it, it does have a, a kind of religious element to it because again, you can't really prove there is no way to totally prove one side or the other. And so there's an element of just belief. And anytime mm -hmm. there's something like that um, and it becomes central to how the person views themselves and navigates their world, there's a closed offness to it. But even then um, I saw, I found myself, you know, when I would have people respond to me about this episode I did um, and say, well, no, I actually don't believe there's free will or whatnot. And um, I tried to sort through myself because of course, you know, I, I notice when I'm like, mm, I don't like, you know, pushback on this thing I hold central to myself. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I know that it's not going to threaten or harm me. I'm a, I allow people to pursue their own mode of existence in the world. And I think that's kind of uh, the weird thing that we've gotten away from is that dissent, difference, disagreement, diversity in truth is a threat to us. And that's not new either. Again, you know, this is like, it's, I think in a way we've become so arrogant as a species to really believe that we are so progressive and so evolved and we're not like those animals that were you know 200 years ago that wanted everybody to be the same no no no. i mean you know we're literally the same exact species only our environment has changed and god knows in what way that truly affects us it's hard to actually quantify that and so i think you know what we have in western society is a very interesting thing where we have 
we allow so much diversity and we truly allow for so much freedom that you can carry out a mode of existence in life that is completely different to mine. And as long as you play by the rules that allow us to continue doing that each in our own ways, you're not harming other people. You're okay. You can do that. And yeah. historically we've mostly respected that, but there's been this strange change and I attribute it somewhat to the collective nature, the collective culture of social media. It is mm -hmm. directly in contrast to the individualistic culture of our societies because it is so much about groups and, um, you know, presentation, appearance, representation, mm -hmm. alignment, camps, the, you know, you, it's very common, this tribalist, uh, the critiques of tribalism that come out of social media. And so we've gotten away from being able to just allow people to have their own different ideas from us. Everything becomes a mortal threat to our existence. And that's a choice of framing. Because the reality is, uh, if you're going to pick a place to live on this planet, there are not so many options that are going to allow you to, to you know, be as diverse in your thought and, and lifestyle as the West allows. So, I mean, yeah, maybe you feel threatened by other ideas, but trust me, there are places that are much more threatening than this. So, yeah, I think a lot of it just, you know, people are in their bubbles and, and it's just almost like you're just protected, you know, like that, that we're, yeah. we're anti-fragile and people are just yes. become very fragile in their ideas and their thinking, especially when they get isolated in these echo chambers, that their whole news feed and everything is all aligned. You have yeah. um, just two quotes that I want to, I, I wrote down that I, that really align with stuff that I, I talk about all the time. Curiosity, not condemnation is the most effective way to solve problems. And as a school teacher, I'm always pushing that. I think that's beautiful. Um, when you least understand is when you should most try. And um, that like this idea, my question to you, um, is how do we, how do we, um, bootstrap this? Like, what do we do for those of you that, for those of us who are listening to this and, and, uh, uh, you and I, like, we both believe that the world will be a better place if we can use this technology that's, that's held in our phones and through the internet and get everyone to adopt these kind of enlightenment principles about how to how to think and how to how to interact with one another and it's not tribal on the right or the left it's way beyond politics it's it's just a general approach to how to how to interact with each other how do we grow this i mean i guess when people ask me that i go I shrug and I say, I don't know, become a school teacher, start a podcast and an Instagram account. Cause I, I don't that. effing know. This is, this yeah. is, I'm doing what I think I can do, but what, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? How do we grow these ideas to the masses? Because you know how closed off that the, the, the target audience is that we want to try and get to this. So how do we get to them? Is it, is it what Jonathan Haidt says, which is, you know, the brain is a story press processor, not a data processor. And when, especially like conservatives, I'd say throw like data, it's like, that does, doesn't, it's like yeah, yeah. bounces off. Yeah. So does it have to be through story? Does it have to be through art? You're an artist. Like, does it have to be through art? Cause that's one of the calls I make is to artists to say, you know, let's, I need, we need you to promote these, these, these important enlightenment principles. I don't know. How do we I completely do it? agree. I do think yeah. that art plays a massive role and that's a great, it, um, that's a great framework to analyze this from is that people need stories because I mean, we can get really far here um, because when we were talking about the idea that identity is one of the main attractants to this type of closed minded uh, mode of being, well, then we need to solve that. So rather than have people cling on to these uh, frameworks that are inherently closed off, they must be because they are identity based. They, any type of crack in the framework is a threat to oneself in that way and one's worldview. That's absolutely, I mean, there was, there is nothing you would fight more than something that threatens your worldview mm -hmm. and yourself. So really the best way I see to um, kind of cultivate and encourage um, 
uh, 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 really it's a return. It's not something entirely right. new. We are right. returning to, a, the, like you said, like these enlightenment ideals where, um, you know, we do not want to go back farther where there was a time when you were punished for your ideas. If your ideas deviated too far, you were punished because they almost, it was the kind of thing that they tainted you. You were tainted by being wrong, you know, and things like this. So, you know, I mean, we've put people to death for saying that, you know, the, 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 the earth, you know, the sun didn't revolve around the earth. Right. Socrates so, was killed for asking questions. There you go. <laughs> exactly. So the youth. We don't want to kind of have this, um, this view of information, especially in an information age, I think that uh, the best thing people can do is to detach themselves and their identity from facts. And these, I see these things as very dusty and very dull and very rickety. They're human made, they're, uh, they're co a collection of theories, which is something that's inherently unstable and is going to change eventually. New information is always affecting these things. So. Uh, you know, coming, coming back to this idea of aligning yourself with certain values. This is one of the first uh, things I really started to write about and um, uh, kind of birthed my philosophy was to divorce myself from any camp or idea. You know, I don't call myself anything. I cannot call myself. I mean, maybe I guess the most cl close thing I could say is a kind of classical liberal. But even then, right. I cannot say that because if tomorrow comes a day where the liberal camp puts forth an idea that I don't agree with, I'm going to not agree with it. And whether that makes me, you know, not a liberal anymore or not. What about uh, religion? Are you religious? I'm not religious and I okay. don't call myself agnostic. I don't, I mean that, I guess you would categorize me as that, but I don't really feel a need okay. to, um, to really uh, attach myself to any certain um, title or group because I find them very restrictive um, because there's this, this clause that you, you, you accept when you join in with any yeah. pre-made uh, idea, which is, you know, these are the things we believe. And it's just, it's very simple. It's not necessarily nefarious that if you join um, the socialists of America, you need to follow a certain level of their ideology. You know, this is, it makes sense. It's fine. But the thing is, that's a trade. You're trading off a little bit of your own freedom there and, and your own ability to question and to pursue your own path for that membership. Maybe it's, you know, it behooves you at that moment, but uh, you'll have to consider if you're willing to trade off the ability to question that thing. And so I don't, you know, I don't align myself with anything like that. Rather, okay. I pursue certain values. So it's like if you kind of cultivate an identity based on your values, okay, integrity, uh, empathy, compassion, truth, um, discipline, gratitude. There are so many values that you could even take certain ideas. You could take conservatism or leftism and you can boil them down into the values that you resonate with and have that guide you. Because then when tomorrow the, you know, the next leftist idea comes out and you say, mm, I don't know about that. You yeah. don't have to feel this kind of like, ah, but I've already signed up to be part of this thing, you can say, that doesn't sound compassionate. That doesn't sound truthful. I pursue truth and compassion, not that, because it does not align with that. So I don't know, I think it's, it's we've gotten into a place where, uh, of course, you know, lacking in a secular society, in a very free society, in a very diverse society, it's never been harder and more of a personal responsibility to define yourself than it is now. And um, there are shortcuts to that because there's yes. always someone willing to sh uh, sell you a shortcut, but there's a price for that. And I think we're seeing it. Absolutely. It's really well said. The reason I bring up religion um, just as we close out is the, uh, I think that, I don't know, I tend to believe that human beings have some desired some some seeking for some sort of religious tendency somewhere but you know a lot of i'm friends with a lot of scientists and i get why scientists don't want don't um fall into a religious category because they want to just leave 
like, like you said, like it's a very similar mindset as you. It's just like, I got to find out what is. And if I adopt this religious mentality, then that might close me off to something that I don't want to be closed off to. So I get that. But I, a lot of the, the, the woke stuff, and even on the other side, a lot of like, even like the, the you know, MAGA stand stuff yeah. is also feels, it feels religious. Like it, oh, it's absolutely. filling that, that cup, that container that has been abandoned from traditional religious, religion um, and religious practices. It's got kind of filled in it because that's what religion does. What happens if you die? I got an answer for it. What do you, how, do, how should I act? I got a set of rules for it. It's very mm -hmm. similar in the way it's constructed. But, you know, so that's why I asked that question. Um, but I think, yeah, you're proving that you don't need that. And, um, you know, a lot of really brilliant people that are also fighting against this stuff, a similar fight as, as you and I, also don't have that religious cup. And there are people that, you know, claim to be whatever, Christian or Jewish or something like that, and they are deeply into the woke stuff too. So I don't know. Yes, yes. So that is such a big topic, and it's so important because I absolutely do agree that there is um, humans need – that religious framework because it's our it's in a way i i really believe it's our um our cure for mm. our unique invention of self-awareness yes. we uh, yeah. are really the only well animals that can question and say why am i here mm -hmm. why should i do this what happens tomorrow you know we need something to deal with that that's yeah. something that no other animal has except for us and religion in the way that we have no other animal has except for us there are animals that do have these kind of like i think elephants um have shown these very primitive little little hints at a kind of ritualistic behavior mm -hmm. and they're also extremely extremely intelligent so it seems like these things go together so of course human beings being the most uh, developed in their intelligence and their ability to question and be self-aware would need, would have the most robust need for a system to assuage the, the, the fallout of that development, essentially. So, I mean, you look at um, this kind of, mm, like woke politics, however you want to describe it, it's even just leftism, it's fine. Uh, leftism has always been uh, secular, because, you know, like if you look at China's authoritarian regime, uh, Cuba's uh, communist regime, there, there is no religion. And that's because the state is the religion. It's on purpose. It's not an accident. They don't want you seeking answers from a higher being and that they cannot control and that they cannot, you know, give you the answers already. This state is where you get your morality. This state is where you get your instructions on how to live. And so... Um, it's not a kind of a novel development, actually, to see uh, certain types of um, politics turn into these uh, kind of neo-religions. Of course, the right has always had actual religion. That's the thing. They are religious. They are already religious. You know, there's always like the moral majority and all of these things. Like historically, yeah. they've been doing that. So the, to the left, that's interesting because they say, oh, no, we're not religious and we don't want religion in school. But then you see all these kind of developments that are very, you know, quasi-religious in the way that they conduct themselves and the way that they truly put heresy on trial, you know, publicly now. So I think that what, it's not particularly that I don't need religion. It's that I, I actually really like religion. I like looking at uh, the, the old stories in the Bible and I, I really enjoy uh, uh, studying different religions and just mystic belief even not it doesn't have to be particularly organized religion um like There's i grew up there. yeah absolutely yeah. i mean it's it's you know it's incredibly arrogant to think that there could be these systems of belief that are ancient and mm -hmm. share so many universals across time and culture and uh well no they're just you know they're all wrong you know yeah. this is like kind of uh it's, it's very a simplistic view of um of religion because it's an invention it's, it was invented for something and it's just mm -hmm. we are not so uh, we're being a little arrogant and saying well the only reason it was invented was just to give us a reason for when we die you know there's a little more there i think and so but you can boil that down and say well what other things could it answer well how to live 
how to treat mm -hmm. other people, mm -hmm. how to decide who's on your side and who's not on your side, you know, how to organize a society. A lot of, you know, the, the kind of uh, texts that we mock, you know, don't mix fabrics or whatever, don't eat pork and things like that. They were telling a certain group of people in a certain time how to organize their society. It's not that they're silly and wrong and arbitrary. They just don't apply to you anymore because you're not in that society. Right. So, but there are other things that do answer different questions. So I think now our challenge is to answer those questions for ourselves. And um, that's very scary and it's a lot of work. And so it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to become like the Ubermensch and whatever and create a whole new morality for yourself and pursue this, uh, you know, desolate individualistic path. I don't even think that's really realistic to ask of most people to kind of like take on this journey of being a, a, a heretic in society that we are. There are people that need to have that role and we discount how crucial it is to have kind of like the heretics throwing rocks outside the church every now and then. You know, you need to have these people that push back. Um, yeah. But you also need to have the people that maintain the actual society it's not only dissidents and it's not only you know the the average population they need each other and so really i think the average person's job right now is to not look for the answers for who you are and who you will be in these archaic systems where really you're just getting your answers from someone else you know yeah. it's not that these things came out of the ground someone wrote them you know these are ideas that people made so you can make those ideas too you know you don't need there's are not we treat politics like they're biblical texts now like the you cannot question them they are sacred you're a heretic if you do you know on both sides it's the same thing and of mm -hmm. course because it's serving the same function it's my tribe it's my group it's my identity this is, you know, it's, it ultimately limits the person. It limits you to being only what is allowed for you to be within the confines of that ideology. So I think if you decide instead to define that for yourself in a modest way, you know, decide what values you'll live by. Decide what you want. What do you want? Do you want to be part of a group? Is that your biggest thing? Do you want to, to um, just be safe and comfortable and, you know, left alone? Okay, fine. That's one way to live. You're not going to find much growth in that way of living because your humans are meant to be uncomfortable. So it's like, you know, I don't trust things that give us these easy answers for how to escape discomfort. Very well said. Um, <laughs> Saloma, thank you for, for doing this. This is, I don't know, I guess, like, I just wanted to bring you on, first of all, to meet you and things like that, but also to just any way that I can give you a platform, give you a microphone. And I know you have your own, but I'm going to now reveal you to some people that ha aren't familiar because the more that your ideas get spread, when I see someone, you know, that, you know, posts like, you know, repost some, like something of yours, I'm just like, oh yes. Okay. It's getting out there more and more and more. So that's, that's why I started this podcast was, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons, but one of them is to try and give, you know, some sort of, you know, just like a platform that, that to people who, you know, may, may or may not have a platform, but to expose them to new people. So I really appreciate you doing this. I just think that you're, you're really, really wise, you know, and oh. it's weird because you're like 10 years younger than me. And you're like so wise. It's a, it's a strange thing. You're wise beyond your years. And, um, and I think that that shows that I, just how in, intentional you are in your thinking. You're very intentional and you're very, you know, pointed. If you, you have a very clear goal in, in your thinking process and you're not being haphazard in, in your approach and everything like that. And I just think it's, it's really inspiring. It really is. Oh, it's, it's thank incredible. you. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I think it's something that people can develop. I really don't think, you know, it's uh, uh, some type of inherent trait and or a talent you know you can it's it's a, thinking is a skill in so many mm -hmm. ways you know mm -hmm. and you can choose how you're going to use that skill and then you can hone it for that purpose um and it is it is really one of the most powerful skills you can have it's something that it's what makes you not an animal you know it's, it it's makes the, the world better difference. It's, like yeah. you said, it's how we solve our problems. It's the only it way we're going to solve the problems that we have. Absolutely. Where can people um, find you, see you, follow your stuff, you know, subscribe, yeah. all that kind of stuff? 
All right. Well, I write a newsletter that's about everything I'm saying, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's on Substack. It's called Weird and Good, but won't be able to spell it. So just find me on social media at Salome Sibone. Um, I'm sure you will link that for people mm -hmm. that are, will Absolutely. have trouble spelling that. I, <laughs> I sympathize yeah. with that. Um, I also just started a podcast, which is uh, kind of about what we're talking about, uh, where I take movies and I mm. use movies as those stories that we're talking oh, about, where you cool. can get those uh, larger narratives to kind of get a framework for navigating the world. Because if you look, you know, humans, it's funny, we talk about... Um, you know, how different we are. We're so polarized. We're so, some people are so different and, and we're, we can't, we're, we're unable to, to find the common ground, but humans are remarkably similar. There mm -hmm. are just, we, we hyper-focused on our differences. And when you look at history and you look at the stories we retold for thousands and thousands of years, we care about the same things. And we have been rediscovering the same wisdom for thousands of years. So that podcast, uh, the silver eye society, it's, um, half of it's free, half of it's on Patreon. And, um, that's kind of an attempt to, to bring a little of that ancient wisdom into the modern day using our own yeah. modern stories, movies. Yeah. And, um, I think that's it. Just social media and podcasts and the newsletter. Cool. Well, I'll link those things. Yeah. I mean, I think the archetypes are really uh, amazing. I love uh, Jonathan Pajot and things like that. Yeah. He's um, great. He's great. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, please, whoever's listening, go check out her, her work and support her work because it's how we're going to get out of this, this craziness. I really believe that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can do it. I mean, at the end of the day, the exit is a beautiful one. If we make it, it's one in yes. which people become better. They become you know, better versions of themselves, individuals, where we get along better. It's, it's actually like, we're all seeking the same thing and it is mm -hmm. essentially a better world. Yeah. And we'll, and, and I think we'll get there. It just depends on how, how soon. So let's get that there sooner question. rather than later. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.